Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? How are you? This video is the history of the Colorado Rockies baseball team in Denver, part of our Denver series. The second week of two weeks, we're going to be doing videos on Denver, which will eventually become a book called Joe Ditzel Has Some Problems in Denver. And before you we go any further, I always like to say up front, because this might be a longer video, uh, this isn't real. I'm making all this up off the top of my head. So I don't want you to get 15 minutes into it and go, wait a minute, wait a second. <laughs> this is a bunch of baloney. And that is, in fact, what it will be. So the uh, let's just get into it. Okay, with that disclaimer, with that disclaimer, is that enough information to make, <laughs> allow you to make a decision? The Colorado Rockies, guys, we've done the Nuggets, that was yesterday, before that we did the world famous Broncos, and now we're talking about Major League Baseball in the great city of Denver, and of course it's the Colorado Rockies. Now, the Rockies were named after a very famous movie called Rocky. And the, one of the original owners was a guy named Sylvester Stallone, who played the character Rocky in a series of films about a, a down-and-out boxer who ultimately triumphs in the city of Philadelphia. And that inspiring story led the original owners of the Rockies to name the team after that character. Now, what's interesting is because of that tie-in, it's not unusual for people from Denver to run the steps, the famous steps that are in that original movie, Rocky, where he, he uh, in part of his training... He runs up and down the steps. I believe it's a government building in Philadelphia. I forget the name of that building. And so it's it's common for a lot of people to do that because it's a famous scene in the movie. But there is an outsized percentage of those people that are Colorado Rockies fans. And in honor of the name of the team named after that character... They'll run up and down those steps. Now, the problem is they're from Denver. And not only are they used to less uh, oxygen in the air, but they generally aren't in that great a shape. So what happens is the uh, paramedics, the paramedic squads, the emergency teams around Philadelphia are used to seeing people with Colorado Rockies gear on trying to run those steps. And the oxygen levels are just different in Philadelphia than they are in the Mile High City. So um, they, they, for a while, even had spotters out on those steps watching for people with Colorado gear on. Or that maybe looked like they were from Colorado. Maybe they had a beard. Maybe they looked like they um, had at one time had their own microbrewery in their basement. Those are all tip-offs that, you know, you're looking at a potential Denver resident and a Colorado Rockies fan. And so that way they'd get the uh, ambulances, the stretchers ready to go. But nonetheless, it's still, however you cut it, is a really inspiring connection to an icon iconic movie of uh, the, the details... The, tri the trials and tribulations of one man trying to make his way in the world and the amount of grit that he has to develop, the, uh, the depths to which he has to explore his own commitment. And, of course, all of those are qualities that the Rockies try to display every time they take the field. Speaking of the field, where do they play? Well, they play at a place called um, Dewar's Field. Now, this goes back to the Rocky theme where they want to suggest in the Dewar's Field naming that this is a team that gets things done. So you can see right away that all of the iconic, iconography, 
all of the symbols and emblems and stories and myths around the Rockies are specifically and purposefully geared toward getting things done, winning, grit, determination, coming back again and again, persistence. So that's why they named the field Doers Field, because they want the team to be known as Doers. Now, they used to play the very first season, uh, what did they play? It was not a, do it was not a Doers Field, Beca until, they got, until they got established. And My Mile High Stadium, they played for the first two seasons, I believe. So now they are, let's see, let me look at my notes here. They are in the NL West, okay, and play at Dewar's Field, which is just south of downtown in Denver. Now, the Rockies are a solid team. This is not a uh, slack team or a lousy team or a, a basement dweller. This is a team that has not as yet won a World Series, but they've only been in existence, I think, from the uh, mid-60s, okay, when they first became an expansion team along with the uh, Florida Marlins, I think. So because of that, there is always pressure on them, especially when the other big teams in town don't do so well. <coughs> Broncos. Uh, so <laughs> when the Broncos ain't bronkin', there's more pressure on the Rockies to produce a winner. and uh, But I, I believe that the Rockies will eventually knock on that door of the World Series and bring it home to the Mile High City, and there'll be you know celebration all around. You know, you have half the population with beards uh, in this city, and a lot of those beards are 12, 14, 26-inch 26 ZZ, 26 ZZ top-style beards. So when the Rockies do bring home the World Series, you're going to see more sales in beard oil uh, than you have in, in the last 75 years in this country in any one particular market. Not only that, they'll probably decorate their beards in celebration, if not paint them outright with spray paint. So you're going to have a run on beard oil, beard spray paint, and beard decorative items. Uh, probably related to Victory, Americana, the Rockies, World Series and all of uh, the related winning, winning themed uh, beard decorations that are available in beard stores. Now, this is the only city that I know of, though there, be, there may be others, but it's the only city that I've run into so far that has a beard store on every corner. You can't go, there are more beard stores in Denver than there are Starbucks. And in fact, they, there is a big chain of beard stores, in fact, the number one chain, the biggest one, there's different ones, but the biggest chain of beard stores in Denver, which is called Super Beard, Super Beard uh, Chain, they actually talk to Starbucks about potentially opening either, they, they, they talks broke down, it didn't happen, and the contention or the disagreement or at least the different visions, they couldn't figure out, should we open a Starbucks in every super beard store or should we open a super beard store in every Starbucks in the city because they knew that the beard aficionados in Denver which is basically every guy uh, and, and really anybody over 12 in Denver I'd say 98.9% .9 of them have beards and it's just part of the mountain man history of the town it's part of the frontier it's not any really attempt to be hip. Uh, there are hipsters in Denver, but really it goes back to the outdoors uh, lifestyle, the mountain man past, the pioneering past of the high plains. And every, anybody over 12 has a beard. And so Starbucks and the super beard store couldn't come to an agreement on, on who would, whose store would be in whose. Really what they should have done they should have taken half the Starbucks, put a beard store in them, and half the beard stores and put a Starbucks in them. Who? What's the difference? But that's the way the big business goes, and uh, everything's a negotiation. So the Rockies have uh, done well, though. They, they did win one National League pennant in 2007. And there's a lot of reasons that they, they did very well that year and maybe haven't done as well since. 
And that was because the support for the city was at an all-time high. And the reason being is that baseball, although it has its ups and downs, tends to be one of the steadiest fan sports. You don't have a lot of bandwagoners, right? And just about that time, you had an influx of people from other cities uh, moving to Denver. 2007 was a peak in uh, immigration from other cities, people trying to get out of, you know, a messed up city like, let's say, Los Angeles and moving to a city that has yet to be ruined, and that is Denver. Well, what happened? What happens when you have an influx of people from out of town? You have new fans. Maybe they didn't have a baseball team in their city, or maybe their team sucked, and here was a chance to jump on with the Rockies. So, in other words, the support was at an all-time high. Now, if you don't think that there's such a thing as in basketball the sixth man, or in uh, baseball the tenth man then you're dreaming because it is a real thing. And that refers to the people in the stands, the fans themselves being an integral part of the victories of any kind of team. So no matter, no matter what sport, no matter what team, that hometown crowd, guys, is an, an important support system and motivational system for any team. And so in other words, the Rockies' motivational levels were at an all-time high. And not only that, they, they had fo refocused their diets on the Rockies into a paleo-keto uh, vegan platform. That's what they called it, paleo-keto vegan, uh, otherwise known as PKV. Now, the PKV diet was originated by a couple of the players that are a little bit more on the hippie side. And they tried to, they walk around the... Uh, they walk around the, the team dressing room there, uh, handing out vegan cookies. And these guys would have flowers in their hair, and they, they would say namaste a lot, that kind of, that kind of uh, player. And, uh, you know, it ac actually eventually worked. They started, because I think also the players were getting pressure from their wives to lead a more uh, nutritious lifestyle, a better, better diet, because really, if you were to um, remove the pressure of a player's wife and the pressure of healthy, uh, health-oriented team members, your average Major League Baseball player would eat McDonald's three times a day. They would eat McDonald's. They would maybe they would eat Wendy's for lunch, and perhaps they would put a pickle on a square. Square hamburger from uh, Wendy's and call that their uh, vegetarian. They call that their vegetables. You know that's just the way ball players are. They're they're a no fuss, uh, no frills group for the most part. Even if they have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, that just means they're going to have a uh, more expensive gold chain around their neck. But in terms of their diet and day to day lifestyle, they would just rather go to McDonald's because that's how they grew up in you know, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or in San Juan, Puerto Rico, right? They, don't, they, they didn't have anything then, so why should they change now, even though they're wearing a mink coat that's worth $450,000 that says, uh, in, in the back of the, and of course it's a fake mink, it's not real mink, but in the back, uh, the mink, the mink colorings, the different stitchings on the mink Right, they'll have a lighter mink mixed in with a kind of a gray and black style mink, so it has a pattern. And a lot of times, the players will form those patterns of their mink coats into words on the back. Uh, like one guy said, "I am the return of Elvis," you know. So you don't know if they're being ironic or if he actually believes he's the return of Elvis. But as an indicator, this one player he'd wear that mink coat in the dressing room while doing Elvis moves, right? He would do the hip shake in and the, all of it. he would pretend he was Elvis. And then at the end of doing a medley of Elvis hits, he'd say, I am the return of Elvis. Hey you know, and the other players at first were just laughing and falling over each other. But after the third or fourth uh, game that he was pulling this off afterwards, they just asked security if they could just carry the guy out. And uh, eventually security got one of those carts that they take people off the field when they're injured. They would back that up to the dressing room. 
and they would strap the guy to that thing and cart him away. And, and that, therefore, I mean, come on, you're in a group of people that is with each other a lot. You can't be acting the fool all the time. It gets on people's nerves. So that's really the reason that the Rockies were able to do so well in 2007 was because of the increased support from out-of-towners, the increased motivational levels of the fans, the increased... Uh, and they feel it on the field. They feel it on the field, and then turn, they gave a better performance and were able to bring home their first National League pennant. Now, did they did they convert that into the big time with the World Series win? They did not, but it's a process. And the Rockies are in, in the middle of a process of building a championship team. I mean, look at the Cubs. How long did it take the Cubs? So the Rockies also are maybe not the highest paying team in town, uh, in the league. I mean, you've got some of the rookies making thirty to $40,000 a year. And uh, sometimes I think that's a little too low for ma Major League Baseball players. Now, what the owners will say is that these guys are more than welcome to spend their off-season hours or their downtime during the season working for the uh, chain of stores owned by the owners that the owners run. And, uh, and, they'll, and, and they said, we'll, we'll give them a fair hourly wage and we'll think about giving them health care. That's, the, that's what they say in terms of criticism about the low levels of pay for rookies on the uh, actual Major League Baseball team itself. And that chain of stores that they run out there, it's called Angles, and Angles refers to the steep slopes in the Rocky Mountains, and it's an outdoor store, it's a uh, mountain climbing, supplies, uh, snowboarding, skiing, any kind of outdoor sports. Angles is there to provide every need, every piece of equipment, every uh, medical care, uh, emergency repair, on the slopes, uh, ropes, any kind of uh, gear you need to l lead the outdoor lifestyle. In fact, they have such an extensive clothing selection for outdoors people that you don't even really have to do any outdoors activities. You just have to look like it. And the Chain of st and Angles is an outdoor supply store that has more clothing along any kind of outdoor sport than anybody in the world, probably. And that's just based because of the history of uh, Denver leading an outdoor life, outdoor lifestyle. I mean, Denver's the kind of town where you have babies coming out and they'll wrap them in a mountain climbing uh, blanket. Okay. You have babies coming out and they will put their little feet in a tiny snowboard, right? They'll put snowboards on them at three, four days old because they want them to get used to being, uh, you know, the weight of the snowboard and, and how, how to stand up on it. They'll get them standing up at two weeks old, standing up on the snowboard. Now they can, the baby can hang on to the parent's uh, finger uh, to try to balance, but you know, then the parents, there's a lot of pressure to get your kid snowboarding early. A lot of the parents will uh, very subtly and quietly remove their finger because they want their baby to be the first that balances on a snowboard without any help from the parent. So you have, you know, they're pushing it day by day. So in other words, at two weeks, if they get every baby up on a snowboard with uh, assistance from the parent holding, holding the baby's little tiny hand with one finger, then, then what, what, what was happening is some of these competitive parents were very quietly pulling their finger out of the baby's little tiny hand uh, to see the see if the baby would balance by itself. And they would do that not not in two weeks, but in like 12 days, 10 days, they kept, you know, and you had some super co competitive parents that were doing that at like four or five days old. And the babies would balance, you know, there's, they'd wobble. The and then in fact, one of the videos of all these babies wobbling on their snowboards up there in the hospital, uh, they put it to a, a techno track and somebody uploaded it to uh, TikTok and it became a viral hit of these little babies 
four or five days, 10 days old, wobbling on their snowboards, trying to balance. And the parents uh, looking on with support, but also with determination, like you better do it. You better do it because you know, you guys, your, your snowboard uh, career in the Olympics is gonna pay for my retirement is what the look on the parents' face said. So that's the environment that you have in uh, Denver. And of course, it's such a big sports town that the Rockies have to compete against some very big brands in order to get the casual fan to spend their money on the Rockies. So they've tried to make, they put little spins on baseball to try, try to make it more exciting in Colorado. Uh, like for example, they tried doing a wiffle ball season where instead of a regulation MLB ball, they were using wiffle balls. And I guess the idea was that they, the ball would have less of a chance of going outside the park, and so you'd have more action on the field itself. Because there's nothing more boring, right, than sitting through 18 foul balls or whatever. So with the wiffle ball, and it wasn't you know, the wiffle ball that you could get at the uh, big box store in your town or order online. These were weighted wiffle balls. So they would tape pennies and uh, nickels and dimes to the inside of the wiffle balls. They'd work the coins into those holes, and then they'd stick. You know, they'd get somebody with little fingers to uh, tape them down. And you know, some of these pitchers were able to really get some curves on those wiffle balls. It's not easy hitting a curveball that's coming in at you at uh, you know 55 miles per hour, right? Because the wiffle ball was going to travel at a slower speed. There was one rumor. There was a rumor that one pitcher was able to stop the ball in midair and let it hang. Uh, I don't know, I think that was just an optical illusion, but that suggests to you that, uh, you know, the ability of the pitchers to manipulate those balls was unparalleled as compared to a regular regulation Major League Baseball. So that was one idea. They also had the idea of letting one of the uh, people, one of the fans play an inning or two. They'd put them in right field or somewhere where they're not gonna get hurt. And then they would just tell the pitcher, look, throw pitches that are not going to get angled out to right field. You know, keep it on the infield, keep it on the left field, whatever you have to do. And this would usually be when they're ahead five, you know, they're playing some scrub team uh, like the Marlins, let's say, and they'd be ahead 10, 20 runs. And they, they'd let a fan actually take the field with the Rockies. That was to engender fan loyalty. Uh, they, they let fans drive the team bus occasionally. Now, that did turn out to be a little bit disastrous when an old lady from a small town outside of Denver, a lifelong uh, Colorado uh, Rockies fan, uh, was driving the bus. The problem was she was 98 years old, and her glasses were not really up to the prescription that she needed, and she inadvertently rolled the bus off the side of the freeway on a trip to uh, down to play the uh, Texans, the Texas Rangers. And uh, nobody was hurt because there's plenty of padding inside those buses. The old lady wasn't hurt because she just was buckled in tight. And the whole time the bus was rolling, she just kept going, woo, woo. She was having the time of her life. Uh, but after that, they cut out the idea of fans driving the uh, team around on the team bus. But it does ex show you the innovations that the Rockies, uh, Colorado Rockies, are willing to try ideas, get them out there in the marketplace, and let the marketplace decide. Because as the owners know, you don't, you never know when you're going to have a hit. Okay, you just got to put things in front of people and see how, which they bite on. All right. So, for example, one of the ideas that was very popular was they put a haunted house in the outfield. So while the game was playing, you'd have fans uh, screaming at the top of their lungs because of the various ghouls and goblins that they let the... In other words, the haunted house rooted itself through the outfield. So you have these fans screaming at the top of their lungs while the players are actually catching balls, throwing balls, and the game is underway. Uh, now you say, well, why don't they just put the haunted house next to the outfield? Well, that's where the Rockies are a, a cut above in their marketing approach. They want to get a really integ integrate these ideas into the gameplay itself. 
And that was a hugely successful uh, promotion, and they've done it every Halloween ever since. So that's where the Rockies are today. I, I think that um, what you have is a team that's just a, a matter of time, okay, before they become a dominant uh, New York Yankees level play uh, franchise uh, on the on the uh, on in Major League Baseball because you have unlimited funds. All right, they're owned by a uh, that retail chain that is hugely successful. Uh, the owners drive around town in gold plated Humvees. All right, so so that's that's why they have the funds. They have the ideas. They have a leadership that's not stuck on themselves. They're open to uh, ideas from other people, from the fan base itself, from their own organization, from the players. In fact, they'll get they'll regularly speak at area junior highs, and they'll get ideas from junior high kids. Some of these twelve uh, year olds, eleven year olds, they've got some great ideas. Like one kid uh, at a junior high recently, uh, one of the owners went out there to give a speech. And this kid said, look, why don't you put the hats where they change colors while the game is playing? The, the hats will actually change colors. Just use modern LED lights. And, and at the end of it, he said, look, why don't you put it where there's fish inside the hats and then the backgrounds, the background behind the fish is changing color. And to their credit, the owner actually tried this for a few weeks during that season. It was turned out to be technically more difficult than they thought, but there you go. Again, the team is open to innovation, and they put things into practice. Not a lot of teams do that. I mean, I could name three franchises right now at the top of my head that, if one, if they had an original idea, I'd slap myself in the face, and two, if they actually implemented anything that could help the team win, I'd slap the other side of my face, and then, and finally, if they hired the staff that, you know, that could actually implement a winning strategy, I think I'd tell you that I would eat a bowl of oatmeal with marbles and uh, toxic lead paint flakes from the ceiling in your, uh, in your kitchen. So, I'm just saying, the Rockies are not that team. The Rockies are an innovative, forward-thinking, professionally-run organization that listens to every constituency in their realm. So that means eventually they're going to be a big winner. Well, guys, that's just a snapshot. That's just a really an overview of what's going on with the Colorado, Colorado Rockies. We're going to have so many more videos on this great team. We're going to look at some of the players that have stood out over the decades, little profiles, little mini, mini profiles on them. We're going to talk about the team strategy, what they could have done maybe in 2007 to go all the way to the World Series, what they've done since to overcome that disappointment. We're going to look at some of the uh, owners and uh, up close and personal interviews with fans. It's, it's just going to be a lot of fun as part of our Denver series. And uh, again, this has just been a parody video. Let me know what you think. Did you love it? Did you hate it? And I will talk to you soon.